Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thanks for listening to this episode. I want to again thank Team for their support of this particular podcast. Uh, they have been a great supporter of the myopia community, helping to uh, make clinicians and offices run better, whether it's calling and scheduling appointments, whether it's answering the phone, helping with billing issues, scribing in the exam room, whatnot. Having a virtual team member in your practice is a real show stopper. So with that, I want to thank team again for their support. Check them out at hireteam.com. That's H-I-R-E-T-E-E-M.com or click the notes in the show description below. Thanks again to team. Thank you for joining us for this episode. I'm here with my good buddy, Aif. It's so good to good do see this you, man. in person. The last two or three episodes of the podcast that I've done with you have been virtual, which has been amazing to get to do that. That's the wonder of COVID. But we're at GSLS, and uh, Aif has been somebody I've looked up to for years. I remember when you spoke at the Academy in an orange suit uh, on, uh, on contact lenses. I love. I remember what you were wearing because it was an orange suit. That's a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you were branding the Dutch at that moment. That's right. <laughs> yeah, if people don't know that I'm Dutch. Yes. <laughs> Aif, for those who don't know you, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, where you live, your background in contact lenses and, and eyeballs. And eyeballs. <laughs> All right. So I'm Dutch. I, we did live in the U.S. for about 10 years, but yeah. um, back in the Netherlands, back in Amsterdam for, for 10 years. About 10 years now, huh? So uh, it's been a great experience, though, to see what's happening here and to take best of both worlds, really, because... Europe, to be honest, yeah. and I gotta say the other way around as well. Maybe you can talk a little right. bit about yeah. that uh, later. But uh, hey, yeah, well, not too much about me. But I'm an educator. I'm a researcher. I'm a writer. Uh, I love contact lenses and everything related to it. So yeah, myopia is uh, is part of that. And um, hey, your wife is Dutch, so we That's have right. we have that in common. <laughs> got that My wife is Dutch. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we, we both married Dutch women. Yeah. Hey, so so I was uh, giving a presentation today on artificial intelligence, Very nice talk. and uh, thank you. And uh, was talking about things that are currently available, things that are coming available. And Aif eloquently said, "Well, let me give you a perspective of what's happening in other parts of the world." And I know that these things are happening, but I don't know too many people who are utilizing uh, artificial intelligence within their technology to then with very minimal touch of a human, have a lens go on to a patient's eye that has been really AI driven. Yeah. Now that's happening to some degree on some devices and some things in the United States, but there's still a lot of regulation that's keeping that. But you were happy to share that, hey, th we're leading the way with this in the Netherlands. This is happening on a regular basis. Tell us a little bit over the last 10 years since you've been back, how you've seen practitioners make this transition to the point, I think you were telling me like 80, 90% of practitioners are doing this with the help of artificial intelligence. So give me the story. Yeah, so the story starts with the fact, and, and you know that, that uh, rigid lenses has always been very popular in the Netherlands, right? So 25, 30% of lens fits, even a couple of years ago, was always rigid lenses. We have a couple of companies that always done a lot of rigid lenses. Labs from the US with two or three lathes would come to the Netherlands and they're American, right? They think yeah. they're good and they are good. And don't get me wrong, US has many, many, many good things over where yeah. we are. But um, they would come to the Netherlands and think, oh, let's see what these little guys are doing there. They come to these big ass, sorry to say that, uh, labs right. with 20 lathes. I mean, and there's not just one company, there's a couple of companies with 20 lathes making RGP lenses. And that was in the time before sclerals. Yeah. So there's a big history of that. And um, I'll be very frank with you, nobody's listening, right? No. Um, I always benefited from that, from the knowledge that the Netherlands had, the manufacturers had. They didn't publish a lot, 
uh, they kept it to themselves or they didn't well we didn't have the uh, scientific background the, the, the right education basically to publish but I always benefited from the, the knowledge from my peers and you know the people I looked up to and I could go to the US and, and lecture and always say hey well this is what we're doing back in Europe and um, why don't we learn from each other because like I said I think on both ends uh, we can really uh, benefit from each other's knowledge long story short there are companies in the Netherlands now that have databases with hundreds of thousands of uh, lenses uh, let's let's take ortho K they know exactly Dave when to go from a spherical lens to a torx scleral lens I can tell you if it's somewhere between 30 and 40 microns elevation difference on the ocular surface over a certain court I don't want to get too uh, technical here they will tell you go to a toric back toric lens in fact they won't tell you that they're doing it yes, do. yeah. so you just upload your topography and they can make the best uh, ortho k lens for you they know exactly with that eccentricity of the cornea with that curve etc 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 they know the success rate they know what lens to pick um, so I think the future looks really good. There was a big discussion today with Nathan Efron about the future of, of RGP lenses. And one of the discussion points was, well, do young kids coming out of school know how to fit an RGP lens? Well, they don't have to know because technology is taken over and they will do that for us. Mm -hmm. I, I want to back you up for a second. Okay. So you said... Going too fast? Yeah. No, no, no. You said that they'll upload the topography yeah. and then they'll make the lenses based yeah, on so that. Yeah, so let me, let me interrupt you for a second. 95% of practices in the Netherlands have a topographer, so that's where it starts. But yep. sorry, go ahead. And, and so when they're uploading the topographer, they're probably not uploading a PDF. They're uploading like the... The where, data where, file. The data file. Yeah. And so the lab can then go with each different brand of topographer. Now, is there you know, 16 topographers, or yeah, is there kind of really them. narrowed down to... They have favorites. Yeah. They, they'll tell you, we like to work with company A, B, C, or D, but uh, if there are 16 topographers, all of them, you can upload your data. And then they're able to incorporate that data into a database, right. and then they're able to culminate this information to know that every single time that we've been successful with a final lens, right. it's been toric if it was over 30 to 40 microns, so in order to reduce our remake rate, right. we're not going to give you the option. And also, Dave, we're not limited to two meridians anymore, 90 right. degrees apart, it's 360 meridians, so they can, every hump or bump or elevation difference up to the micron, I mean, Dave, to be quite frank, we can measure eyes up to the microns of accuracy now with corneal topographers and profilometers. The lates can make lenses up to nanos of accuracy. It's us, the eye care practitioners, that still think in 0.05 or 0.1 steps. That's 100 microns. <laughs> These machines laugh about 100 microns. Yeah. Is, those are huge steps. That's like three, taking three or four steps on, on the stairs if you right. go up, right? So um, all I'm saying is we're the weakest link in a way. Right. And I'm not saying they should bypass us. Oh, we're in control because we, we are the ones doing the topography. And the quality of the topography is extremely important. Rubbish in is rubbish out. That's what they tell us. But if you do a good topography, you... They make the lens for you or you design it yourself. You can do it yourself, but software if you want. I think they can do a better job because they have that big database to compare it to. So, and one thing I wanted to almost add to your lecture is the, we have two things we should distinguish. Distinguish. We have um, big data. Yep. These guys have databases of 125,000 scleral lens fits. They know exactly, again, when they go from corneal to scleral, they know when to go to a toric scleral lens. It, I can tell you, it's between 80 and 90 microns. Mm -hmm. If that's elevation difference, that is over a bigger 60 millimeter uh, cord, they know that's what you have to do. Um, but the point I was getting at is that um, they can really help us make a better product. Yeah. 
So, so you're telling me that the fits are largely driven by data, topographies, and uh, and, and you know, data that is is input, right? You, you still led that the practitioner is doing that. I want to talk about the next generation, and that may be where we start incorporating progression. Right. Right, right now, that may be you know, data that's put in from an axial length machine, right. right? Putting refractive correction in there. Just just theorize for me what that might look like in the next iteration yeah. and how how would a, a design maybe be modified utilizing that type of information. Yeah, so that's a very good point. So the point I was trying to make uh, and I wasn't quite clear I think, but so you have big data that we can benefit from and you said it so well, in your lecture, we're already doing that. Mm -hmm. That's what we're using. But the next step is truly artificial intelligence is when the instrument is going to tell us what myopia lens design or profile is best for that eye based on higher order aberrations that you've measured and everything. So it comes to a point where it's not as simple anymore as comparing the one eye that you have to a big database of 100,000 eyes and say, oh, you got an average eye or not, and you should do this or that. The next step is actually incorporating all that data, and we can't do it anymore. So our intelligence is simply not sufficient anymore. That's where you need the artificial intelligence. Yeah. And that, I think, is going to be a huge step up. You mentioned myopia. I think for myopia, the future is so bright, we have so much that we can benefit from in this arena that we haven't even touched on yet. Yeah, uh, a little bit outside the realm of, of the myopia arena within the podcast, but everybody who listens is, is, is a contact lens fitter. You really helped lead the way on this project with sagittal depth and soft contact lens fitting. And I see the same sort of opportunities around this for mass production, mass contact lens fitting where you know I may take a, a, a you know a capture of a patient's eye and artificial intelligence may then be able to tell me here's the top two lenses that you should try on this eye that that is within the realm of what we can do based on your paper exactly but uh, we may be able to even go further exactly. and say now this patient has had this dry eye condition or this patient is in this environment you know, this material then has worked better in this elevation or this, so With go to this With analysis, first. as you said, if yeah. you can combine all that. And some people are afraid of that and they think it's going to take away from our profession and our professional integrity, if you want. It brings us back in control over yeah. that process. We're making a decision, yeah. not just And we just can actually based. charge a fee. Yeah. If people charge a fitting fee for soft lenses, yeah. and it's I question them, fee. Based on what? Yeah, yeah, and 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 bringing this big data into things, you know, as 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 we move in this direction, you know, my hope is that our technological advancements from diagnostics, where you know everybody's winning in this, the patients are winning, the practitioners are winning, and the industry is winning. The industry, sorry to interrupt you, is winning because I'm convinced. Hey, but it's just my two cents. We can reduce dropouts. Yeah. So the whole industry, yep. it, also the big guys, are benefiting from Absolutely. this. If we can keep them in lenses. Yeah. Everybody is happy. Yeah, yeah. We bring things in, you know, it, it, I, I just think about, you know, uh, again, going back and diverting back into myopia, what higher order aberrations do we want kids to have in order to slow down the myopia? And, and this is based off of our limited experience and understanding right this, but I get, if you can get me 300,000 kids data yeah. on their aberrations, yeah. as well as what's happening before and after treatment and what progression has occurred and axial lengths have changed, yeah. We're going to start to see some trends here. Uh, no, AI is going to help us start to see yeah. these trends and maybe be able to be, you know, make some suggestions as to this patient actually, you need a, a low ad or a high ad or you need this yeah. lens to change in this way. We can custom design that lens if we need to. It's almost like reverse geometry of the myopia, um, well, enigma maybe. So on the front side, people are trying to figure out how can we effectively reduce myopia? We have no clue. No. We, at this point, we have no clue because there's so many factors. It's not just putting a plus somewhere and as much plus even anywhere. 
it's it's more complex than that. We know from the glasses, new glasses that come out in Europe now, that even with glasses that just produce contrast, yep. um, they work. Yeah. So it has nothing to do with blood. So right. we don't understand. But so the red light, blue light, green light, purple light, whatever right, it may be. Right, I'm from Amsterdam, so I'm I'm on the red light part. <laughs> but uh, no, it's the red light. It's yeah. the red light that uh, that works. But um, so uh, we need to figure that out. But it's going to take a lot of time. So yeah. you could also do the reverse and design it from the other way around, like we've done in contact lenses often. See what works, and then design it back to say, well, yeah. listen. This profile works pretty good on that kind of eye. Uh, why don't we try that? And we don't understand yet why it's working, but hey, OrthoK has been around for a long time. It works, and we still don't understand exactly yeah. why it works. But yeah. So there's two approaches, and I think we should try both. But if we have to wait until we fully understand the mechanism behind myopia, then what are we going to do in the meantime? It's right? almost as if the intelligence that we've been using all this time has been artificial anyway, right? We might as well lean into the yeah. actual artificial intelligence to help yeah. guide the process Good in the point. future. Good point. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. I wow. could talk with you another hour yeah. about well, this, you but made me I don't want to. Again. <laughs> I got to think about that. Yeah. Uh, appreciate what hey. you're bringing to us from oh. the Netherlands. I think about it in, in this way is sometimes the safety measures that are in place within regulatory aspects um, really slow down progression. And in this country. In our country. And also, we've got so many great laboratories and companies here that that may also be slowing it down, whereas you've got uh, many practitioners you know, working with a few number of, fewer number of labs who are doing a bulk of the supply and so they're able to then culminate this data you know not for the entire country but a large part of it and they be able to maybe that's helping you innovate at a faster rate um, or maybe it's just because you're Dutch no, well it's true <laughs> I enjoyed chatting with you and thank you for joining us for this episode make sure to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time on the myopia podcast One, two, three, thank you for tuning in to the myopia podcast if you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.